continue our series in the parables of the Lord. And today we are up to the parable of the Good Samaritan. That's in Luke chapter 10. So you can open your Bibles to Luke chapter 10. And while we're doing that, we will just take a moment and focus our hearts on the Lord. And let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we have free access to your word, that we can study it freely with our opposition, uh, that we have all sorts of resources available to us, Lord, to enable us to know your truth and to know your message of love to a lost world. Lord, we pray that we would focus now on this message of yours, the, the parable of the Good Samaritan, that you would speak to us through it. You would challenge us, Lord, convict us where we need to be convicted and draw us closer to the image of Jesus Christ, your Son. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing now and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So the parable of the Good Samaritan is from Luke chapter 10. And we've uh, spent a couple of weeks now in the parables of the Lord. And last time we studied parables about the heart of God. Uh, of the heart of our Heavenly Father. And we looked at three parables. It was the, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the prodigal son, or the lost son. So this week we start looking at parables about the heart of a believer, the heart of a Christian. And so we are in Luke chapter 10, and we need to get the setting of this parable and so the setting of this parable starts back in verse 17 and the parable starts in, in verse 25, but we'll get up to that in a moment. So the setting here is the 70 disciples that Jesus sent out have returned and they're overjoyed about uh, the abilities that, and the gifts that Jesus has given to them and they are rejoicing about the success of their little missionary trip and Jesus said in um, verse 21, when these people are rejoicing about um, the, the power that they've received from Jesus, he says in verse 21, in that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. So we get a, a glimpse there of Jesus' purpose in speaking in parables. So those who have ears to hear, have eyes that see and a heart that's open to the truth are the ones that receive uh, the, the message of Jesus. So today we continue and we look at the parable of the Good Samaritan. And uh, just before we start that, Jesus prayed a prayer in verse 23. And it says, and then Jesus turned to his disciples and said privately, blessed are the eyes which see the things that you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see what you see and have not seen it and to hear what you hear and have not heard it. So now we begin the parable of the Good Samaritan, verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested Jesus, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So a lawyer is an expert in the law of Moses. So he's a teacher of the law. And so he's asking this question to Jesus, What must I do to inherit eternal life? Now when I read verse 25, I'm a little bit cynical. I think that Perhaps this lawyer is not really genuine. He's not asking this question because he wants to know the answer from Jesus. He's asking this question as a test. He's trying to trap Jesus. 
In Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, we read, Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. So I don't believe that this lawyer is actually genuinely seeking the truth. He's setting up a trap, he's setting up a test for Jesus, uh, and his soul is not upright in him. So Jesus answers um, the lawyer's question with another question. So we continue reading in verse 26. Jesus said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? And so he says, the lawyer answers and says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your, all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbour as yourself. And Jesus said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. So Jesus understood the lawyer's heart. He understood what was happening here, and he knew that this was a test that the lawyer was setting for him. And so Jesus answers his question with another question. Uh, what is written in God's word? What is written in the law? So the lawyer actually gives the correct answer. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength and love your neighbour as yourself. And Jesus praises the lawyer's answer. But then he follows this up with, do this and you will live. So follow the law, follow it perfectly, and you will live. So do this and you will live. But Jesus knows that no flesh can perfectly follow the law. In Romans chapter 3, verse 20, we read, Therefore by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in God's sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So what this expert in the law, what this lawyer should know is that years of striving to be perfect and holy is it's not a fruitless task, but it's one that's impossible in the flesh. He would know that. God set up a sacrificial system so that those who followed the law could pay for their sins. So the lawyer should have understood better than anyone that in the flesh, no man can fulfill the law. In verse 29, we continue. But the lawyer, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbour? So if you look up that word neighbour, it means someone who is near, someone who is close by. And a common opinion among the Pharisees was that only other righteous people are your neighbour. So you only have to love other people who are like yourself. But we know that the lawyer has an agenda. This whole scenario is just to trap and catch Jesus. So Jesus continues and he answers uh, this question with a parable. So we read in verse 30 to 35, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, 
and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two coins, gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan. And this is to answer the lawyer's question, who is my neighbour? So notice that the, uh, the man who is left on the side of the road, he looks half dead. And so there's a, a clue there to the response of the first two men who walk by. So a priest, if he touches a corpse, he becomes unclean. And in Leviticus 21 verse 1, we read, And the Lord said to Moses, Speak to the priests, the sons of Aaron, and say to them, None shall defile himself for the dead among his people. We also read in Ezekiel chapter 44 verse 25, They shall not defile themselves by coming near a dead person. So the priest that walks down the road sees what appears to be a corpse and thinks, well, I don't want to become defiled. I don't want to become unclean. So he looks and passes by on the other side. He doesn't even go near the man. And same with the Levite. He does the same thing. So a Levite is someone who serves in the temple, uh, follows the same rules as the priest. He looks sees a, a man that appears to be dead, passes by on the other side. So both the priest and the Levite choose to remain ritually clean and pure, undefiled. And then the third person that walks by is a Samaritan. So who are the Samaritans? In 2 Kings chapter 17, verses 23 and 24, we read this. So Israel was carried away from their own land to Assyria, who conquered them, as it is to this day. Then the king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Kutha, Ava, Hamath, and from Sepharvaim, and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. And they took possession of Samaria and dwelt in those cities. So when Israel sinned, rejected God, God sent Assyria to judge the people of Israel and they were conquered, captured and taken away into captivity. And the king of Assyria replaced those people of Israel with people from other countries. So the, the remnant in that area of Israel in Samaria were mixed with people of other nations, of pagan nations. And they intermarried, and uh, so a new type of people um, arose in that part of Israel, the Samaritans. We get another clue in John chapter 4, verse 9. So when Jesus tra travels through the land of Samaria, uh, he meets a lady at a well. Then the woman of Samaria said to Jesus, How is it that you being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman. For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. So the woman is saying, she's explaining that Jews and Samaritans hate each other. From generations back when the Assyrians conquered them, the Samaritans have been a mixed nation. So they are Jews, but they've intermarried and mixed with people from other countries. So the pure blood Jews and the Samaritans hate each other. They're enemies. They are not friends at all. And so that's why Jesus chooses a Samaritan as the third person in his story. So we read again in verse 33, But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw the man, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and set him on his own animal, 
brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day when he departed, he took out two coins, gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So the man that Jesus uh, included in his story, the example of someone loving their neighbour, is the worst enemy of Israel. So Jesus couldn't have picked a, a worse person to be the hero of this story. So Jesus ends his parable with a question to the lawyer. In verse 36, Jesus asks, So which of these three do you think was neighbour to him who fell among the thieves? And notice that Jesus turns the whole scenario around. The lawyer asked, who is my neighbour? He was trying to justify himself, his position of only loving people just like himself. But Jesus' question is, which of these, th these three do you think was neighbour to him who fell among the thieves? So Jesus has turned the whole thing around. And the lawyer is trapped by Jesus. He's got no other answer but to say, he who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to the lawyer, go and do likewise. So the one who tries to trap, trap Jesus is the one who gets trapped by the, the author of the word himself. And so there's a message here for all believers, not just for those self-righteous Pharisees. The message here for, is for us today. So we're not Jews going through Samaria, uh, finding people beaten up on the side of the road. We're all Gentile believers living here in Australia. So what does this parable mean for us? So today, uh, like the Samaritans back in Jesus' time, there are people that we might consider our enemies. People who would mock and ridicule and do all sorts of things uh, like we've seen in, on the world stage recently in the news. So I know that I was offended when I saw those things and lots of people were calling for, for justice. Those people should be, be punished for what they've done. They've mocked, they've ridiculed, um, they've insulted uh, the Lord and his people. And it's easy to get caught up in all of that, to, to, um, to, to follow the crowd and to hate but the message of the good samaritan is to love your neighbor and especially those who don't know jesus so the lawyer asked two questions the first question is what shall i do to inherit eternal life we have the answer to that question and we need to share it to the people in Slovenia and to the people in Craigieburn. So Jesus gives us the answer to this question, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And we have to take that question wherever we go. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, it says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. That's Jesus' command for the church, for us, to go and make disciples, teaching them to have faith in Jesus, to be baptised in his name, and to be discipled in his word, in his truth. We also read in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, and Jesus said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptised will be saved. In Luke chapter 24, verses 46 to 47, then Jesus said to them, thus it is written and thus it was necessary for the Christ 
to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all the nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And then in John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31, And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have, you may have life in his name. So brothers and sisters, we've been given the answer to that question, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And it's our job to give that and share that wherever we go and even to those who might be our enemies. So who is our neighbour? Everyone we meet. Everyone we meet along the side of the road. And we've got the answer to that eternal question. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's close our time in a word of prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, uh, we live in a world that mocks you, that ridicules you, that accuses you. Uh, give us the courage, the strength and the boldness, Lord, to take your message wherever we go and even share it with those who would mock you and would claim to be your enemy. Lord, we pray that we would be a neighbour to everyone we meet, that we would share your love, your goodness, your truth, wherever we go. We want to glorify you, Lord, uh, magnify your holy name. We want to see people saved for your glory. So we ask this in Jesus' name.